We're here with Marvin Singh. Marvin Singh is an integrative gastroenterologist practicing in San Diego, California, using cutting edge tests and personally designed protocols based on patients' genetics, microbiome, and lifestyle. He is one of the few in his field to combine traditional medicine with complementary therapies. As an expert in his field, we're talking to him on the best ways to support the gut-brain connection and protect the microbiome. Welcome, Marvin. So glad to have you here on Feed a Healthy Brain. Thanks for having me. So we often hear discussions around leaky gut diseases and the permeability of the gut. How does someone know if they have a leaky gut? Well, it's a hot topic these days. Um, I think, you know, that, that we do have tests definitely that can help people get an assessment of whether or not they have leaky gut or intestinal permeability. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, if you don't want to do any kind of test uh, and you just want to kind of go by your symptoms and kind of guess whether or not you have it or not, some of the things that you might be looking for, you know, are there, is there any evidence of autoimmune disease or, you know, do you have a lot of joint aches and rashes and, you know, things like that. Um, because often autoimmune disease uh, sensitivities to different medications or chemicals and things like that could be a hint. doesn't necessarily mean that you have leaky gut, but it could be a hint. So that might, uh, you know, perhaps prompt you to get an evaluation for that. Mm, interesting. So I guess, sh should we explain what leaky gut actually is? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, gut, uh, the gut or our digestive tract um, is not lined by, you know, uh, cement thick, uh, uh, lining of cells. It's only a single cell, uh, that manages this, uh, very important barrier. And this single cell is connected, uh, the, all these cells are connected to each other, you know, through these protein complexes called tight junctions. And so as you can almost think of it as like a little bridge kind of going between two cells. And when that little bridge in between each cell gets uh, hurt or injured by something, whether it's a medication or antibiotic or an infection or anything, then that, that bridge uh, allows contents from inside the digestive tract that should remain inside to actually leave the inside of the digestive tract. And some of those particles, whether they're bacteria particles, food particles, um, can actually get through the gut barrier and into the bloodstream. Then the immune system says, oh my God, what is all this stuff? And starts launching an immune response to it. And so in somebody that could be your skin where you have eczema and somebody else that could be your joints and you get uh, rheumatoid arthritis, you know, and others, it could be your brain, like we're talking about the brain. So, you know, that's kind of like the foundational principle of um, leaky gut and, and how it happens. Try to talk to you in a simplified way to try to explain it. So yeah. hopefully that clarifies that. <clears throat> that was great. So Dr. Singh, following up on that, how does someone take steps to heal their gut lining or prevent it from becoming increasingly permeable? Well, uh, that's also a great follow-up question. Um, so, you know, I always say we got to take it back to the basics. So, you know, uh, the take it back to the basics means you got to try to eat the right foods. You have to try to avoid toxins in your environment as much as possible. Exercise, reduce stress, sleep, enjoy life, uh, you know, uh, have fun with your family and friends. Even social interconnectedness actually can impact your gut microbiome, which can affect uh uh, leaky gut as well. So all of these things, these basic principles of lifestyle medicine are important to try to, you know, help uh, keep a healthy gut barrier. And then, you know, if you actually have leaky gut, in addition to doing those things, then there are certain herbs and, you know, uh, techniques that we can use to try to help heal the gut. It kind of really depends on, you know, what your whole you know health picture is and what's going on as far as what herbs we use but you know there are things like glutamine um you know zinc carnosine we use colostrum we use a variety of different things that can kind of help heal the leaky gut that's amazing so dr Singh, can you explain what precisely it is about gluten that negatively affects our brain health and can impact cognitive decline well, <clears throat> gluten is a big topic, especially these days where half the stuff in the store is gluten-free. <laughs> um, but, 
You know, I think uh, that's kind of a, a little bit of a loaded question because a lot of things that have gluten uh, are uh, foods that uh, contain sugar, or can become sugar. So, you know, uh, bread, uh, for example, is your almost your prototype for gluten. And bread is a refined, uh, made from refined flour, and that becomes sugar very quickly. So, you know, sugar is one of the biggest uh, problems in our diet, and that is a large contributor to, you know, imbalance of the microbiome and leaky gut. Uh, additionally, gluten itself uh, can... A trigger release of this protein called zonulin in our digestive tract. And zonulin, um, you can think of as the switch that, uh, you know, opens the drawbridge. So we were talking about this little bridge between the cells earlier when we were talking about the, the gut barrier. And so you can think of uh, zonulin as like the light switch. So, you know, you have a guy standing at the end of the, the drawbridge and he flicks on the sw uh, switch and the drawbridge opens. Well, you actually don't want that drawbridge open because that's the barrier that you're trying to keep shut. And so um, uh, all these contents that we talked about that can leak through the gut barrier and get into the bloodstream can now do that. So when zonulin is there, uh, that can occur. So um, there's been some research. Uh, Dr. Alessio Fasano from Harvard almost 20 years ago now, uh, kind of discovered zonulin and its effects. And so that's one of the biggest links with gluten. Mm. So how does that play a role with cognitive decline and how does that impact cognitive decline? So uh, good question. Um, you know, that plays a role in brain health because leaky gut and gut imbalance can lead to inflammation. And so when you have inflammation, that inflammation can affect the brain as well. So that's why, you know, one of my mantras is healthy gut equals healthy brain, because all these things that we need to do to protect our gut barrier are the things we need to protect our brain. Um, and so when you have an imbalance of your microbiome and you have leaky gut, uh, what can happen is you get uh, a systemic inflammation response. So like, you know, inflammation can occur in your whole body. And the brain is one of the biggest places that could be affected. So it's kind of like a trickle down effect. So it's not that gluten, you eat a piece of bread and all of a sudden that bread goes to your brain and now you go crazy. You know, it's not like that. <laughs> so it's kind of like, it's a, it's a series of events. So you have, uh, you know, an ongoing exposure to something, for example, like gluten, which can increase the levels of zonulin in your digestive tract, which can make the gut more permeable. As a result, then you have this leaky gut and imbalance in the microbiome together can create a systemic inflammation in the body. And as a result, the brain can be affected. This is a gut and the brain are very closely connected to each other. Right, and we're gonna get into that a little bit more later. But let's talk a little bit more about gluten. Should everybody limit or abstain from consuming gluten? Well, <clears throat> I think that's a good question. It's uh, probably not an easy question. I think definitely if you have celiac disease, which is an autoimmune condition to gluten, um, you definitely should, because that's the main treatment. Um, a lot of people often benefit from uh, gluten avoidance, even if they are not uh, specifically sensitive. So, you know, there's a couple of different categories. There's celiac disease, which is an autoimmune condition to gluten. Definitely, you should avoid gluten. Uh, then there's people who have non-celiac gluten sensitivity, so they may not have the autoimmune condition, but at the same time, um, uh, they get problems if they are exposed to gluten, so they should also avoid gluten. Um, and then, you know, there are people, you know, who may have symptoms like bloating or problems with digestion, and they, they may also benefit from avoiding gluten as well. Um, and so I, I personally generally avoid it as much as possible because uh, a lot of the foods that contain gluten are also foods that, you know, are, are high carbohydrates that can become, you know, uh, increase your levels of insulin. And when you have higher levels of insulin, you have higher levels of inflammation. So uh, I generally think it's, it's not necessary for health to have gluten in your diet. I also think that gluten comes in different forms and shapes in different places. So for example, in the United States, the, the gluten uh, and wheat of, uh, you know, that we have 
perhaps in this country may be different than you might find in Europe. People often say that, you know, oh, you know, I definitely can't eat bread or gluten or anything. But when I go on vacation in, you know, Europe, uh, I eat the bread there and I have no problem at all. And a lot of that may have to do with the quality of the food product. You know, is it sprayed with Roundup? Are there other pesticides and herbicides there? What, what's actually happening to the plant that's turning into the product that you're eating? So that's uh, probably a bigger, you know, bigger scheme picture uh, looking at, you know, tolerability of the food itself. Oh, that's so interesting. So what's your opinion on consuming gluten if you have a predisposition towards a neurodegenerative disease or are starting to show early symptoms of a neurodegenerative disease? I think if you're trying to optimize your diet uh, and uh, your health and try to prevent and avoid, you know, uh, these kind of issues or things from getting worse, it doesn't hurt to stop. Uh, it doesn't hurt to avoid it. Um, it's, it's not like we're giving a medication that, you know, could potentially have all these bad side effects. We're just trying to, you know, alter the diet. Um, and every little bit may help, you know, um, leaky gut and uh, brain issues don't just happen with one thing. So I guess that's one of the things that we want to make clear for people. It's not that, oh, the reason why I have Parkinson's disease is because I grew up eating bread. And this is not, it's not, not that simple. The body wasn't made, you know, that simple. It's a series of things and, uh, it's, you know, like one hit, two hit, three hit, four hit. Okay. Now eventually over time you develop a problem. Um, gluten could potentially be one of those hits. So if we can remove, um, something like gluten that could be contributing to the overall picture, then, Hey, you know, you know, that's, that's one, that's one plus on your side. So it's worth a try. So Dr. Singh, another key topic is both refined sugar and artificial sweeteners and their impact on the health of the gut as well as the health of the brain. So what is your recommendation on consuming sugar and sweeteners and would you recommend one type over the other? Um, yeah, so sugar is bad and fiber is good. That's my mantra in the office. So. Like <laughs> that in itself could have answered your question, but um, <clears throat> I think you know we got into the, uh, the era of uh, realizing that sugar was bad and there was calories and cause inflammation. And so, you know, what the food industry did was say, okay, well, here's these artificial sweeteners where you have zero calories and you still can have something sweet, you know, like you can have your cake and eat it too type of a thing. But that's not necessarily, that wasn't necessarily the uh, correct answer, you know. Um, these non-nutritive sweeteners or these sweeteners that basically have no calories but um, give you the taste that you want to have are probably just as bad, perhaps even worse than actual sugar itself because it creates all this derangement of your metabolism. So you may taste the sweetness and it may not give you the calories, but your body reacts to those chemicals uh, that you're putting, in it, putting inside of it and uh, your metabolism can get messed up. I think as of right now, so far, you know, things like stevia uh, are, are probably free of blame because it comes from a natural source. Um, it, it may be only a matter of time before we, you know, do more studies and find out that stevia may not be the best for us either. But right now, you know, if people want to have something that's a sweetener, usually telling them uh, stevia. Yeah, I like that. So what about non-foods? We all consume from time to time, like antibiotics or food additives. How do these harm and, and what other items could be harming our microbiome? There's a ton of stuff. Uh, we, we, we all get freaked out if I tell you about all the things that can alter our microbiome. Actually, uh, you know, uh, toxins are very ubiquitous in our environment. They're everywhere. In your clothes that you're wearing now, they could be in your necklace, they could be on the paint in the walls behind you. Um, all of these things can affect our microbiome. Um, Antibiotics can certainly affect your microbiome. That's uh, kind of like one of the prototypes of uh, a chemical that can affect your microbiome. We need antibiotics uh, when we're sick, uh, you know, with the bacterial infection. You know, um, they can be life-saving medications. So I'm not anti-antibiotics in, in the appropriate setting. What I am is uh, anti-using a medication when you don't really need it. So, oh, you got a little cough or a cold, it's probably a viral infection, but 
you know, it's kind of programmed in your head that antibiotics can help you with that. So you convince your doctor to give you a Z-pack or amoxicillin or something like that. And then you get better after a few days. <clears throat> and that's uh, probably because the course of the viral uh, illness has kind of, you know, uh, played its course and, and the infection's gone. But, you know, maybe you kind of associate that with the antibiotics working. And so then it kind of gets ingrained in your, you know, mind process that every time I get sick, I should take an antibiotic because that's what helps me get better. So it's not necessarily the case. You know, taking one course of a Z pack, five days is a, you know, the Z pack, azithromycin. Taking one course of that can change the composition of your microbiome for up to two years. Two years. So, you know, it's okay to take antibiotics in the right setting. But if you take it in the wrong setting and you take it over and over again, you can put some important species of bacteria that we need into dormancy for up to two years. And so it's definitely something to consider. And, and these antibiotics are also in our food supply. You know, uh, average American uh, can ingest about 27 grams of antibiotics in the diet annually because these antibiotics are in the meats uh, and foods that we eat. Um, because the farmers are, you know, um, pumping the uh, animals uh, full of antibiotics so that they can get fatter and uh, reduce their chance of infection so that, you know, they can keep, keep the food supply going. So uh, that's why it's also important to look at where you're getting your food. Is it organic? Is it grass fed? Is it antibiotic free? So that's kind of where, you know, uh, all of those labels are important to follow because all these things affect our microbiome um, and the microbiome's resilient so it's not like you know you eat uh, you know one uh, you know non-organic steak and you're gonna be you know toast you know it doesn't work like that either yeah. it's also a multiple hit type of a theory so you know it's like if you've been eating these things and exposed to these chemicals and toxins over and over and over again then eventually you may have a little bit of a breakdown in the gut barrier and everybody's built differently. So I may be able to drink uh, water out of a plastic bottle and get that BPA exposure. And somebody else may be able to drink water out of a plastic bottle and get that BPA exposure and feel a little bit off. And then a third person may be able to uh, drink water out of a plastic bottle, but then as a result, gets very sick from that BPA exposure. Everybody's built differently. We have different detoxification capacities. And so everybody gets affected differently. And the microbiome also plays a role in the detoxification as well. So you can see how it all kind of goes together. They, they even did actually interestingly studies where, you know, people, uh, not people, it was actually a mouse model, but they were exposed to water with arsenic in it. And then they gave the mouse um, probiotics. And that same mouse didn't develop toxicity to the liver as they did, um, you know, without the probiotics. So the bacteria actually in the gut can help us uh, against these toxins. So that's why healthy gut, healthy body, healthy brain, it's all connected to each other. Oh my goodness, so many interesting things there. Um, so Dr. Singh, can you trace the connection of a microbiome in jeopardy to the direct and indirect impacts on the brain? And how does it work? And what conditions might stem from the gut specifically? There are a lot of conditions that can stem from the gut. And actually, you know, uh, I think we're bas basically, I tell people that all chronic disease can come from the, the gut. Um, is when you get this imbalance in the microbiome um, as a result of a variety of factors, things like Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, anxiety, depression, autism, MS, you know, all of those kind of things in addition to diabetes, obesity, fatty liver, uh, heart disease, all of these things can have its sources in the gut. And so um, uh, that's uh, a very important uh, concept to uh, understand. What was the first part of your question again? So can we trace the connection of a microbiome and jeopardy to the direct and indirect impacts on the brain? So I think you just touched on that, but yeah, yeah. So you can, you can definitely see the effects. Uh, I don't know yet. Uh, I think very soon in the future, we will perhaps have tests that can be more specific for gut issues and potential prediction for brain issues. But uh, as of now, there are tests to, that can check the microbiome and investigate what's going on in the gut. 
Um, so you can get an idea of how much inflammation is going on, um, what the gut is doing. And so that can maybe give you a clue and you could use that perhaps with, you know, other predictive tools like genetic predisposition to, you know, Alzheimer's. So you can do, you know, uh, tests that can give you an idea of whether or not you may have uh, risk for that and then look and see what's going on in the gut um, and uh, try to make an intervention perhaps before you have a problem. They do see, you know, uh, stuff uh, from the gut uh, and the brain uh, on functional MRI. So we know that these things, when you affect things in the gut, that you have actual uh, changes that happen in the brain itself by looking at these functional MRI studies. So we know and feel that there definitely is a connection between the gut and the brain, particularly with these disorders. I think how to diagnose the exact connection or to trace the exact connection may be a, a bit challenging technology-wise, but uh, we're, we're getting along that track. Okay. So we talked a little bit about toxins earlier, Dr. Singh, but how can external stressors such as stress or pollution impact the microbiome? And on the flip side, how do positive emotions affect the microbiome? Well, that's good. Um, uh, so... Uh, we kind of touched on the toxins affecting the microbiome. So toxins, you know, uh, you can just think of toxins as something bad, almost like a poison, right? And so um, when you're continually exposed to these toxins or poisons, it can lead to an imbalance in the microbiome. So maybe some of the good guys that are doing good stuff are getting beaten up a little bit. And so their populations may reduce a bit. As a result of their populations reducing, some of the bad guys who may be more resilient to some of these things may have the opportunity to grow. They say, aha, the good guys are gone now for a while. I'm going to grow. It's my turn. And as a result, you have the problems that can uh, occur as a result of that. So I guess that's kind of a simplified way of uh, thinking about how toxins can affect the microbiome. Toxins also can cause injury to that you know, that drawbridge we were talking about earlier, that, that uh, gut barrier, the, the tight junction. And so uh, if you're being bombarded, you know, and the, the toxins are dropping missiles over and over and over again on your bridges, what's going to happen is that you, you may develop a leaky gut as a result of that. And so it kind of all goes together. Now you have an imbalance in the microbiome and you have a leaky gut and there you go. You have inflammation, autoimmunity and all those other things. On the flip side, um, good stuff can cause good stuff. So um, that's another simplified way of thinking of it. So social interconnectedness um, and enjoying a time with family and friends and having fun is a very important part of lifestyle medicine. And it actually does affect the microbiome as well. So we see that there are positive effects uh, on the gut microbiome. Uh, when you're doing, when you, you know, focus on uh, those lifestyle measures as well. So that's very fascinating. And there was a study, you know, called the Harvard Longevity Study, um, where they looked at, uh, you know, men, and they looked at uh, men that lived uh, the longest period of time and looked at uh, what are some of the factors that led to uh, their longevity, what was the most important thing and is actually their social interconnectedness, their relationships that uh, actually contributed to their happiness and how long they live. Interesting. So are there lifestyle choices, and you talked about this a bit, but are there specific lifestyle choices and habits that we can make in order to keep the microbiome healthy? For sure, for sure. This is the fun part that I like talking about uh, all the time. So, you know, toxins we've talked a lot about, so that's a big one, we wanna reduce toxins. We want to exercise, we want to move, we want to eat the right stuff, we want to sleep. Sleep hygiene is also a big one. We didn't touch too much on that, but alterations in circadian rhythms can actually affect your microbiome as well. And that can also affect your brain health. That's actually, sleep is a big thing for brain health and cognition. There's a lot of information about, you know, how uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, one of the biggest risk factors is, you know, lack of sleep. So sleep is a big one. And then stress reduction, stress management, and as we were kind of touching on, uh, cultivating meaningful relationships. So those are those are some of the big ones, uh, the, some of the core principles of lifestyle medicine that we often talk about. Okay. Now we've heard a lot about probiotics, and we talked about it earlier. But you know, what 
uh, specifically is it about probiotics and prebiotics and what's all the buzz about? How does that all help with our, our gut health? So I think um, one of the key things to remember is that the probiotics are not like some uh, magical cure. The best probiotic is the probiotic that you already have in your gut that's going to do the work for you naturally. But uh, probiotics definitely do have a role in helping us, um, especially you know in particular conditions and situations where we need a little bit of help. So, you know, if you get a, a, you need an antibiotic for a pneumonia, for example, then you know taking a probiotic may be able to help uh, keep the balance in the microbiome as a result of having that antibiotic exposure. If you're going to travel, it may be good to help boost your immune system because you're giving yourself perhaps a few extra good guys to kind of give you a little bit of a boost. So there are definitely some, you know, roles in uh, using probiotics. And these days they even have some uh, companies that do precision probiotics so they can look at your microbiome and give you a determination of what probiotics may be best for your gut in your situation. So that that's even taking that probiotic concept to the next level. So I don't think it's all hype. Uh, I think probiotics definitely do have a role and they can help. They can be supportive. You know, you have a leaky gut, you have an imbalance in the microbiome. You could use a little bit of a boost from some good bacteria to help kind of get the balance back and reduce inflammation. Um, and uh, I guess we should clarify what a prebiotic and a probiotic is because uh, sometimes people get that confused. And then there's also a symbiotic. So we make up all these words to confuse people, I guess. <laughs> but a probiotic is the actual good organism. Right. A prebiotic is, you can think of as the fertilizer or the food for those good bacteria. Oh, okay. And then if you get a symbiotic, that's a combo. So that's a pre and a probiotic together in one place. Okay. Wow, that's such a great explanation. I'm so <laughs> analogies, and that was a great one. <laughs> I'm, I'm the king of analogies, I've been told. <laughs> I love that. So, Dr. Singh, some supplements and foods like yogurts and kefir list a single strain of probiotics, while others list multiple strains. So, some list live strains, while others don't indicate at all. So, in your opinion, what should we look for when shopping for a product that contains probiotics? Okay, great question. So, the first thing you should do is look at the label, uh, the ingredient label. Because the probiotic yogurt that you're eating, thinking that it's good for your gut health, may have 16 or 20 grams of sugar in it. So that's the trick. So look at the ingredients. Uh, some of these companies you know, may make a, f a product, uh, that a probiotic a product that is genuinely you know, beneficial for you. Um, others uh, may, you know, be focusing on the marketing of probiotic and making it look like, hey, this is a great probiotic, probiotic, probiotic foods, you know, take all my probiotic foods. Um, and I don't really know how much benefit it really may have because maybe probiotic is part of it, but so is all the sugar and all the additives that they have in there. So you know, you, you know, so you got to kind of pay attention to that. The best probiotic foods are the ones that are uh, as whole foods as you can get. So sauerkraut, kimchi, you know, things like that, pickles, real pickles that are fermented, not, not, uh, not the pickles you get at the bulk, you know, bulk park, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Oh, I'm a huge so you want to look at those. And then, you know, some companies, you know, so it's not that all yogurts are bad because they have sugar in them, uh, and so you shouldn't have probiotic yogurts. There are some probiotic yogurts, like one of my uh, favorite ones is um, is a Bulgarian yogurt, and it has like 90 billion units, and it's a little bit more tart, a little more sour. Um, that's kind of how you know that it's the real deal, um, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, it tastes pretty good, and, and uh, you get better benefit out of it when you you know, look for that. As far as you asked me earlier, how do, what do you look for in a probiotic also, whether it's single strain or multi-strain? I think it also depends on what's going on in you specifically. Um, I generally, you know, for general health, uh, like to take uh, multi-strain because there's over 100 trillion bacteria in your gut. So taking one 
you know, little dose of one organism, I don't really know how much of an impact that might have, you know, unless there's a certain specific condition like C. diff where you want to take, you know, Saccharomyces boulardii because it's been studied to, you know, help uh, reduce recurrent C. diff, which is a kind of infection that people can get in their colon. Um, uh, but uh, I generally take a multi-strain uh, because that, to me, uh, makes me feel that I'm going to get multiple different strains of different uh, helpful bacteria that can do uh, a bunch of different things rather than one that can do one thing. Wow, okay, that makes a lot of sense. So, and can, what, what about fermented foods? And fermented foods with high amounts of probiotics on a regular basis be just as effective as taking a high quality probiotic? Perhaps even better, because not only are you getting the bacteria, you're also getting the nutritional value of the food itself. So like we were talking about kimchi and sauerkraut and pickles, just as a couple of example, you know, there's miso, natto, there's a bunch of different other uh, things um, uh, that, that you can have that are fermented foods. But we try to say, you know, you should have, you should try to integrate it if you can uh, a, a little bit every day. You know, if you can do once a day, you know, have a little bit of sauerkraut or kimchi or, or whatever you like to have. Um, uh, that may be helpful and because you're not only getting the probiotic value of it, you're getting um, the nutritional value of the food that you're eating. So that, that may even be a better option. And it's also good to try to switch it up a little bit. So don't keep taking the same thing over and over again. You know, life's all about exploring and having fun. So have fun, try different stuff and give yourself exposure to a bunch of different bacteria at the same time. So how many, like how much of this should we be getting like every day if we're eating like the kimchi and the sauerkraut and, and all of those things? I think knowing how many billion units you're getting in each serving of kimchi is going to be hard to know because what happens when you, when you eat it is you're putting it in your stomach and your stomach has acid and the acid is there to break down the food. And as a result, some of the bacteria may also um, not make it downstream to the gut as much. So um, I, I don't know that I, there could be any guarantee on how many units you actually get when you're eating. I guess that's maybe the thing, maybe that's what you're kind of getting at with probiotic foods, you know, like the yogurt that say this many, you know, million or billion units in this yogurt. Well, maybe that's what's inoculated in the yogurt, but I don't know how much you're actually going to get. So, you know, that's why, you know, some people also take probiotic supplements and pills, um, particularly that may be designed to help avoid that exposure to the acid in the stomach and make it downstream. So it's not wrong to do both, eating probiotic foods and taking a probiotic. It's just that uh, my point was that if you eat probiotic foods, you're also going to get not only the probiotic benefit, but you may also get the benefit of the food itself. So it's always good to try to keep as natural as possible. And so we have foods that can give us some probiotic benefit, but at the same time, you know, offer us some nutritional value. Right. Yeah. I'm a big believer of getting my nutrients through food first and then, you know, adding in some supplements on top of that if I need to. Dr. Cool. Singh, it's been such a pleasure to speak with you. You've given us so much knowledge on how to nurture that gut-brain connection, and I think we have a lot of things that we can take away here to start really applying that so we can increase and improve our cognitive health. So thank you so awesome. much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me.